On today's episode of the Guild of Dads podcast, I'm joined by Professor of Evolutionary Psychology at Oxford University, Robin Dunbar. In my discussion with Robin, we find out how little human brains have changed in the last three to 4,000 years. The population boom that created large-scale societies and the negative repercussions of the same, and why the antidote to anonymity and large-scale societies is to develop close relationships within your own community. Hi, I'm Joe Horton, and this is Guild of Dads. Hey, you over there. Yeah, I can see you. Come over. Sit down and join me as I'm about to have a conversation about you. A conversation about what it means to be a dad, a role model, and to live a life of meaning. About your physical health, how you look after yourself, contribute to the world around you, and raise our next generation. A conversation that will shape the vision you have for yourself. Forever. Welcome to Guild of Dads, the podcast for dads. Now, in the last few weeks, we've discussed various different uh, aspects of being a father, including relationships and also running your own business and also coping with divorce amongst various different things. And so continuing in the next few weeks, we're going to be carrying on the conversation around every aspect of being a father, which includes mental health, physical health, Uh, relationships and also spirituality to name but a few. Now I've been off for a couple of weeks and so I've come back and this is my first episode back and obviously since that has happened most of the kind of northern hemisphere has been struck down by the uh, coronavirus or COVID-19 so I know obviously as this airs today it will be uh, the case that it has hit the UK uh, parts of Europe quite badly and also Uh, the USA as well so many people being affected by it many dads being affected by it and I think the main thing to say about COVID-19 and coronavirus is that it is just affecting so many people on different levels I mean apart from the actual lockdown aspect of it the actual economic aspect of it for so many dads is really hitting home now and there are dads in different parts of the kind of spectrum in terms of how it's actually affected their day-to-day lives I mean there are dads who are not too affected they're in kind of what I would class uh, sectors where there is more of a guaranteed income but they're also by the same token self-employed and sole traders who are being severely impacted by the lack of work and small businesses so it is a really difficult time for a lot of dads right now and um, although We are going to touch upon COVID-19 and coronavirus insofar as it relates to some of the subjects that we discuss here on Guild of Dads. We will discuss it insofar as it's relevant to the context of what we do here, but I'm not going to allow it to take over the conversation because I realise that at this particular moment in time and this particular moment in history, a lot of guys are listening to podcasts and they actually kind of want to break from it. There is an extreme amount of information overload going on right now and I think it is useful if Guild of Dads as a podcast carries on being a great resource for you guys out there listening but also as partially a little bit of an escape from what is going on in the uh, in the outside world. Now Much of what we discuss on Guild of Dads, bizarrely, is actually really relevant to the situation that a lot of guys are going through right now, more than ever in terms of how you show up in your community, uh, how you uh, cultivate the relationships you have with your wife and your children, um, and how you keep a calm head um, and use different strategies we've talked about in past episodes in terms of keeping calm during a stressful situation, during an ever-changing stressful situation, and where everything is changing right now more than any any other point in um, re- the history that we can remember going back uh, for, for ourselves. So definitely carry on tuning in. There's going to be loads of different 
things that are going to be relevant to what's happening right now and we'll continue to have amazing conversations with incredible people to help you level up in your own life as a dad. My guest today, Robin Dunbar, is a British anthropologist and professor of evolutionary psychology at the Department of Experimental Psychology, Oxford University. His research is concerned with trying to understand the behavioural, cognitive and neuroendocrinological mechanisms that underpin social bonding in primates in general and humans in particular. His understanding has given insights into how humans have managed to create large-scale societies using a form of psychology that is evolutionarily adapted to very small-scale societies and why these mechanisms are less than perfect in the modern world. And now for my discussion with Robin. Robin, welcome to the Guild of Dads podcast. A pleasure. Great to be here. Likewise, likewise. And I'm really pleased that you've uh, agreed to come on and speak with us today because uh, it involves a subject that kind of comes up a lot in the discussions that I'm having with uh, guests on this podcast, particularly around the area of mental health and how our brains have evolved or not evolved, as the case may be, to adapt to kind of the the modern world. And my first uh, question to you, I was going to ask you, um, and this is funny enough, uh, a question from my a 10-year-old daughter who asked me to ask this question before I came down to see you uh, this this evening and that was what what first got you interested in evolutionary psychology and the and the study of uh, primate behavior when did that your interest in this first start oh well um i guess really my interest in human behavior is actually very late indeed i really went to university to do philosophy, of all things. Mm -hmm. Um, But um, just so happened at the university I ended up at, you couldn't do philosophy on its own. And I chose to do philosophy and psychology as the least bad option. And Mm -hmm. psychology introduced me to the sciences, about which I had a very, very limited understanding, and eventually turned me into a um, scientist. But it, it, it really my interests were piqued much more by animal behavior than human behavior at the time. So for about 25 years, I went and studied monkeys and antelope and feral goats in the wild. And then there came a time when there was uh, no money for research in the universities. And uh, I I started doing things on humans because they were there in the street. You could uh, do the same, ask the same kind of questions and study humans in the same way as you studied monkeys, but uh, they had the added advantage is you could ask them questions occasionally, which was clearly quite useful. Yeah. And that got me interested in humans. So really, my interests have always centered around social evolution, really, uh, the evolution of societies in in monkeys and apes and humans, uh, and the behaviors and other mechanisms, the neural machinery of the brain that underpins how we handle this very, very complicated social world that we live in. The world of relationships, yeah. the most complicated thing ever invented in the universe. Yes, indeed. And funny enough, my last podcast guest I was talking to yesterday, we were all talking about that very subject of relationships. And uh, this is a guy who's been uh, uh, ex- an expert in it for quite some period of time. And even he conceded to me, yesterday that he doesn't have all the answers far from it so uh, so yeah there's 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 hope for us there's hope for us yet what do you what do you um how did that uh, that interest kind of frame your uh, the kind of continuance of your uh, interest in um human beings over uh, primates and animals how did that kind of frame how you approached that next phase of your career if you like well, actually, initially, it was literally, quite literally, doing the same kind of things, just sort of observing people in the streets and the park, really. And, uh, you know, we gradually started sort of doing more things that are peculiar to humans, like conversational behavior. What are the limits of the number of people you can have in a conversation? What are the topics people talk about? You know, what is it that kind of um, gets them going, if you like, and uh, and fires them up to talk to each other about. Um, but eventually, 
I, I was really pushed into doing uh, much more brain stuff, neuroimaging. Uh, we started to delve into some of the kind of neurotransmitters that uh, underpin sociality in particular and some of the genetics of that. Um, and then at the other end, because societies are really social networks, or at least we live in social networks of friends and family, um, I sort of bumped into a bunch of physicists or several bunches of physicists quite independently, all of whom were interested in social networks. And that was really very fruitful because, you know, physicists have a toolkit which us humble psychologists and biologists simply don't have. You know, you, they can deal with these huge telephone uh, uh, call databases that, that um, in a way which, which we don't, we will. We wouldn't even know where to start, basically, but they can produce magic out of those. Mm. Mm. So it's this kind of crossover of expertise that enables oh, you yeah. to... Oh, yeah. 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 So everything I do has become more and more interdisciplinary with, with time, really. And, and as I sometimes describe it, it's like sitting in front of an enormous multidimensional jigsaw and you're working in one little corner of the universe and then you sort of perhaps through somebody else fill in a bit of a corner somewhere else. And eventually things start to emerge. Patterns emerge out of this sort of chaos, <laughs> chaos of the cosmos, as it were. And, and suddenly things start to make sense. And you go, oh, my goodness, you know, that fits beautifully with this and explains something else. And everything starts to fall into place. Yeah, yeah. And I think that's how I phrased it in my first email to, uh, when I introduced myself to you, that there was I'd begun to see patterns in the like I said the conversations I was ha having and it was and it was really a case of finding someone with, with the expertise to help me kind of lay yes. some of this together um, yes. and one thing that I think that kind of jumps out in a lot of these conversations is how and to what extent the human brain has changed if any in the last hundred years going back 100 years going back a thousand years has it changed a great deal or are the kind of fundamental mechanisms and parts of the brain still the same as what they were when we were kind of roaming the plains of Africa and, and, and other continents within the world? I think the short answer is um, we really probably haven't seen an awful lot of change in human brains over historical time, let's say going back two or three or four thousand years, which would be regarded as a sort of historical period, um, yes. brains are qu clearly quite hardwired, um, and so major genetic changes are required uh, to produce uh, significant changes in their structure and size, and that takes a little bit of time, probably in the order of a hundred thousand years to actually sort of bring anything to serious to fruition. So effectively, most people take the view that there hasn't been any serious change in, in, in human brain brains or in human brain size and structure, uh, at least for that length of, of time. That said, there are little hints here and there that things can change very fast. And one of those, um, is the fact that uh, those of us whose ancestors come from high latitudes, and that means north or south of the equator, so outside the tropics, um, have bigger eyeballs than people whose ancestors come from within the tropics because mm -hmm. it's grim up north, <laughs> as they say. The low light, um, as we know, you know, it's dull and rainy and light levels are low and you've got these long winter nights and so on. Um, and so being able to pick up better visual signals of animals to hunt or approaching predators or whatever it may be becomes very important. And, you know, bearing in mind that modern humans have only been um, in Europe and Asia that's that far up in him in well let's say only been in europe for the last forty thousand years um you know we can pick up signatures already of that change and, and one of the consequences of having these big eyeballs is we need a big visual system at the back of the brain to handle that so we end up with slightly bigger brains but the bigger brains are 
not in the sort of working end of the brain, which is the front, uh, but rather in the back end, which, which just processes visual signals. Mm. Um, uh, basically because there's no point in having a big camera lens on the front of your um, uh, 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 camera in the, in the sense of eyeballs uh, and not having a big enough computer behind it to, to sort of make sense of, of all the information you're getting. Mm -hmm. And that's a relatively fast change for something that's to do with uh, the brain. I mean, it's, most people would, would have kind of expected major changes, structural changes, to be much slower than that. And clearly, we have bigger brains than uh, you know our forebears, our ancestors who lived, let's say, half a million years ago. That's very clear. Mm. Um, and in terms of how the brain operates, presumably there are core functions that it, different parts of the brain uh, perform in order to uh, a keep us alive, b keep us safe from danger. Um, uh, continuance of the human human race and the, and the and the species. And what different parts of the brain uh, primarily uh, coordinate those different those different uh, kind of fundamentals, if you like, of of staying alive and and further in the species, so to speak. Well, very roughly, uh, your brain has a small sort of inner core, which is very very ancient and is there really to keep body and soul together. And it deals with the kind of automatic uh, bodily functions. Um, and then wrapped around that, you have this very thin sheet, uh, which actually is about a, a, a yard square um, in, in size. Um, uh, and that's the kind of bit that's evolved through the course of primate evolution in particular into humans. So that, that sheet, which is known as the neocortex, the new cortex, as it were, um, is about 80% of your total brain volume. Now, a lot of that is doing kind of pretty boring stuff too. So a big chunk at the back is just processing visual inputs. You've obviously got sort of chunks that are dealing with sensory inputs and chunks that are doing with motor uh, outputs, instructions to the muscles, you know, to, to, to do stuff. The key stuff, at least from a from a social point of view is really at the front end the, and that's the bit that's really evolved disproportionately during the course of human evolution so this is why we have these big foreheads of ours to accommodate um all this um, uh, frontal lobe stuff and and, and that's really i mean aside from the, the fact that it's also where all your conscious thinking goes on and, and sort of integration of sensory inputs and so on from the different senses further back in the brain, um, it's really handling all this enormously complex social calculations which you spend most of your time doing. Mm. Mm. One thing that uh, had a profound effect on me was some years back when I was visiting Colchester Zoo with my family uh, over a weekend and we walked down and we walked past the the primate enclosure and there was you know there was a there was a group of chimpanzees and they were sitting on this log they were chattering they were grooming each other you could see the kind of um the social interaction going on you could see the uh the visual cues they could that you there was certain kind of little nuances in their behavior if you stood there for longer than, than kind of five seconds with your smartphone you could you could see that there was a lot going on there and i stood there and i reflected on it and then i turned to my left where all the people were standing watching and some of them were looking through slr viewfinders some of them were holding up smartphones some of them weren't even looking at the enclosure they were staring down at their smartphones um and this is not a smartphone bashing exercise by any stretch of the imagination but it was one of those points where i looked into the enclosure and i thought hang on a minute these uh, chimpanzees are interacting with each other in a group setting and um, they are fully present. They're fully aware of the social cues that are going on. They're fully interacting with each other. And then I looked outside of this enclosure at human beings that are, uh, <laughs> are meant to have evolved. And my instant reaction was they look like they've actually devolved 
at this point in history yep. rather than evolved. <laughs> and for me, I mean, it's funny. It is, fu- it is funny, but it, it, it underlines quite a serious point where we're at in kind of history. And uh, I wonder what your thoughts were on, on that, Robin. <laughs> <laughs> Disturbed, I think, is the answer. Yeah. Uh, w- when one sees uh, people these days, anyway, you know, sort of locked onto their... Um, their smartphones and and the kind of you know almost the the kind of epitome of that really you know go to a restaurant you know and there'll be a, a couple there a young couple there uh, having dinner together presumably endeavoring to build some kind of relationship with each other that's the main reason for spending all that money on good food and drink and they're both locked on their their phones and you kind of go no 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 put them away you're supposed to talk to each other for god's sakes yes yeah. so, you know it, it 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 does make one this wor- well worry a little bit i think in the sense that um you know the social world goes round only because we engage in it and and if you kind of aren't engaging in a face-to-face way with people uh you're not really being forced to uh learn and develop those skills of co- diplomacy and compromise that allow the social world to work. In other words, you know, if you, if you spend all your time online in some way and you don't like what somebody says, you can pull the plug, you know, or you can go and find some little chat room where everybody thinks the same as you. Whereas in the real face-to-face world, A, you have to meet people who think differently to you because you don't have that choice. You know, there's only five people in the pub, so you've got to talk to them. Mm. Um, and B, you know, that in itself forces you to kind of learn these skills. And these skills are very, very hard to learn. We, we reckon you don't really master them until you're in your mid-20s. It takes that long. Mm. So if you've spent 20 of those 25 years <laughs> largely online, I'm not sure you're really getting the practice and exposure that you probably need. Yeah. Where what the consequences of that will be, we will have to wait and see because we, you know, we can't forecast really where it will take us. We mm. just have to, and we won't find out really for another generation. Yeah. And I was reflecting on this today because, you know, I was born in 1979, so I was you know I, I can remember growing up and we didn't have mobile phones in our house it was kind of you know it was still you had the landline and yep. you used that at your peril because it racked up so much phone bills talking to your mates on the phone and whatever that mum and dad yep. that never used to let you anywhere in a phone so you know we didn't have we weren't it we weren't interconnected as teenagers that didn't come yeah. in that didn't come That's in right. until probably you know the late nineties, early early two thousands. So right. so we're the kind of last group who've probably lived more of our uh, more of our life without digital technology right. yeah. the, the, than with. But yeah. we're the last of that kind of that that kind of group sort of thing. And um, yeah. you do you you do wonder about that. I mean, I heard one thing mentioned last year that that they'd done some s- studies and. You may may correct me if I'm wrong, but they've done some studies, um, some brain imaging, I think it was, on some some kids in their early twenties, and they found that the part of the brain that recognises social cues and different um, facial expressions and stuff, that part of the brain was actually getting smaller. I don't know whether that is an urban myth or whether that is whether that is true, but um, but it would make sense based on you know based on what you know we've been discussing in the last you know. 10 to 15 yeah. minutes. So, uh. Well, I mean, one of the problems is precisely that, okay, you know, the, if you like your genetics and the hard wiring dictates the generic size of your brain and its sort of basic structure, but how the individual bits develop um, is determined really by the experiences that are exposed to. And, and the most famous study of that, I suppose, was the study of London taxi drivers, mm. cabbies, um, and and the the size of their hippocampus? Because that the hippocampus is a tiny little bit of the brain, really, uh, sort of buried deep in the middle somewhere. Um, uh, it, it is involved in ma- mapping, so it's it's really crucial for your ability to sort of think your way through 
the London A to Z in your mind to know how to go from 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 Euston to Camberwell or whatever it may mm. be that the cabbies do. And these guys have significantly bigger uh, um, hippocampuses than than the rest of us because they've spent whatever it is. I forget it's about two years learning. Uh, you know, essentially learning the the, the routes around London. Um, interestingly enough, when they stop doing it, if you like, and retire or go off and do something else, then hippocampus shrinks. But, <laughs> so it's not. It's by no means permanent. The, the brain is sort of is not completely plastic, but it does bits of it do increase and decrease according to the amount of usage it gets. And clearly, you know, particularly from the social uh, skills point of view, the bits that underpin social skills, if you don't use them, you'll lose them. That's for sure. Mm. Mm. Yeah, and, I, and I've heard a similar thing said of um, t- towards kind of meditation and um, and when they've done yes. a- imaging on on I think monks in the monastery who are spend- yeah. Buddhist monks who are spending yeah. large amounts of time meditating it, it begins to affect certain parts of their brain in terms of yes. kind of focus and relaxation and 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 how they're able to kind of regulate and uh, regulate their emotions, so to speak. Yes. One thing that comes up a lot again in d- discussions I have is is the stimuli that 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 we're subjected to in the in, in the modern world, and the example that is often brought up is 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 a um, is in relation to what a typical kind of hunter gatherer would uh, encounter on a typical day in terms of um, uh, maybe sugary berries being in in season at certain points of the year um the amount of the amount of women they'd see in a typical day um and and certain kind of uh, stimulus that that in the modern world are all around us all the time uh and the effect it has the chemicals that it releases in our in our bodies and our brains in terms of the reward mechanisms what 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 would you say about say about that Uh, um, the best known example of that really is precisely the uh, sweet sugary things, mm. you know, that, um, uh, you know, this, this, um, desire for, uh, sweet sugary fruits and the like, and for gorging on them when they're available is clearly in a hunter gatherer's circumstances, highly adaptive because you don't find, you know, little, uh, pots of fruit like that very often. So you've got to make the most of it when, when you get it. And of course, you know, that, that's energy you're taking in. Um, and the consequence of that kind of adaptation, as it were, is to produce this sort of level of um, intake of sugars from all kinds of sources, simply because it, we, we like them, um, in the modern world, and particularly where our foods are often pre-processed. You have to remember, <clears throat> for hunter-gatherers, a lot of their foods are not necessarily raw, but they're they're kind of not heavily processed like ours are. So there's mm-hmm. a lot of fiber in it. Um, the body has to work very hard to extract nutrients, right? A lot of the pre-packed foods that, that we get now, um, and indeed a lot of the foods that we've grown uh, uh, for, for, for farming, um, you know, sort of being effectively genetically engineered uh, over the centuries uh, to be more digestible and all these kind of things. And, and, and the result is we, we just are absolutely flooded with stuff which it doesn't do us any good so we become obese and all these things all the diseases of civilization as they're called diabetes and heart, heart heart conditions and so on and so forth kind of flow from that and you know there, it's the old old story that in biology um you know there is an optimum for everything everything is good for you but only in moderation if you have too much of it even oxygen is a poison <laughs> <laughs> too much of it. Mm. So um, uh, the same kind of applies, I guess, in the social domain because they they live lived and still live in these kind of small scale societies in in a, in a very small world of you know one to two hundred people that they kind of see in anything like a regular basis and a on, you know sort of thinking in terms of a daily basis that's probably only about thirty people. Mm. You know, men, women, and children. So your social world is operating at a much slower pace. Uh, it's much more confined. Um, 
because it's a small village environment, people see what you're up to. <laughs> and therefore, the community acts in a self-policing way. You know, people will make it very plain if they think you're behaving in a way which is disruptive for the, the wider community. Mm -hmm. And I think our problem now has become really since, you know, sort of medical interventions allowed birth rates to explode, which is perhaps the last couple of hundred years of population explosion we've had, that even though we've anchored back on our family sizes here in the West, nonetheless, our children live, you know, the, you know, you don't have these high mortality rates on mm. babies and toddlers that, that we once had. Um, which is the main reason for having so, so many of them. So now you've got these enormous great um, nation states with millions of, tens of millions of, uh, of citizens, uh, all living crammed together in, in, in big cities and the like. Now the problem is, you know, our social world is still the same size, realistically, in terms of the people, our social networks. There's still one to 200 people. But now that network is distributed all over the country, it, you know, it's not like it was even kind of 150 year, years ago when pretty much the whole of your family lived around the corner from you, you know, and all your, your friends lived around the corner from you. Now they're scattered all over the place. So you live among strangers um, and lots of them, <laughs> you know, it, you, all sorts of things sort of follow from that in, in, in terms of, dysfunctionality so because they're strangers people are no longer so willing to police each other then you know they're not so willing to kind of go you know, when you're living in a face-to-face -face society where you know everybody and everybody knows you you know when you granny wags her finger at you know some little urchin of a monkey that's misbehaving in the street <laughs> The little urchin knows jolly well that uh, you know he, he or she doesn't behave better. Yeah, you know, their his parents are going to find out, and there's going to be hell to pay, uh, or whatever his auntie, his uncle, or what have you. You know, the community, everybody knows everybody else. Whereas in the sort of the anonymity of the modern city, um, uh, you don't have those networks anymore, and therefore people are much less willing to sort of say, listen come on, that's just not the right way to do stuff, you know, mm. uh, behave better. And people react badly as well. I mean, uh, in a small-scale society, you kind of hold up your hands and say, oh, terribly sorry, <laughs> yeah. uh, I won't do it again. But in the anonymity of the city, you're kind of, everybody's natural reaction is to say, who the heck do you think you are telling me off? <laughs> yeah. So you end up with the kind of problems we kind of get. And you also get lots of other dissatisfactions, some quite nice stuff suggesting that the fact that you can kind of see glossy pictures of beautiful people of both sexes and you know you can look online at things like tinder and see all sorts of greek gods and goddesses stalking the world and then you look at your your life and you go god it's awful isn't it <laughs> So, so, so uh, look who I got stuck with. You know, uh, you know, there's that. There seems to be a sense of dissatisfaction, or it creates a sense of dissatisfaction, which is completely unreasonable, really, because at the end of the day, particularly for things like mating, yes, there's a kind of ideal you have, but it's a kind of Jane Austen situation. You know, there is only one Mister Darcy, and only one person is going to get him. Yeah. Uh, the rest of us have to settle for the cure, you know? yeah. <laughs> and yeah. you make the most of it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And and in a smaller scale society, you'd be quite content with that. But um, you know, it's only when you can kind of see glossy magazines full of um, uh, of beautiful people and, yeah. and and stuff that you start to get kind of dissatisfied with your life as it were mm. and in the, and, but and, the antidote to that actually is is having lots of friends it turns out because all the work we've done on um social engagement all very clearly says you know the more friends you have the more often you go and have a drink with them in the pub or go out and have a a, a meal with them socially um, or engage with them in some other activity, be it, you know, a, a church or a sports club or going hiking or whatever you do, a walking group, music group, uh, the more likely you are to be satisfied with your life and the more engaged you feel you are with your 
local community, the more you trust your local community as well. So, mm. you know, the beginning and the end of it is really where we began our evolutionary history as social beings, you know, yeah. get on in there and, you know, talk to the guys. But it seems that it's really in the end that's best done face to face. Certainly, you know, we've done several studies where we've looked at people's levels of satisfaction with interactions they've had with their best friends online and offline. And offline always comes out being rated higher. Something about being able to see the whites of people's eyes. Yeah. You know, to see the smile breaking before you finish the joke. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and it's and it's and it's very perceptive that you've said that because the what uh, what I've uh, noticed as well is that there is, for instance, a, more and more kind of groups for dads and groups for men's men cropping up face to face groups, which are not kind of going to the pub or whatever and stuff. There's actually yep. so, there's actually something quite encouraging. I saw the other day. There's a group that meets in the sort of north of England. I think they're in about seventeen different towns called Andy's Man's Club, and they're and I, and I, and. Again, it's um, a group of guys that kind of meet up. There might be 15, 20 of them or whatever. And they put a post um, about one of their meetings recently. Now, because they meet up on a weekly basis in this specific town, the guys are all kind of in touch with each other. They're all looking out yeah. for, for one another. And they know, And on this particular day, one of them was missing. And so they all went looking for him and they found him. And um, he, I think he'd had some mental health issues. So... Um, they took him to hospital and and, and he turned out, things turned out okay. But in contrast to what I was talking about, my experience at Colchester Zoo, that here is a group of guys who are congregating as a group. They're uh, meeting face to face. They notice when one of their number is missing, and they go and look for him. And and that kind of behaviour, I've seen that. You know, we've all seen that on on TV when you're watching. Uh, a nature program where one of them goes mm. missing and the and the others go looking for them so that kind of thing yep. is you know it's encouraging because i think some of this stuff is kind of beginning to go full circle and i think that kind of particularly guys are, be, are, are really getting back into something that's really very much fallen out of fashion and what i noticed as well in the last little while, there's been a lot of kind of conversation around diets and what is the best diet to have for longevity and, you know, primal or vegan, all this kind of stuff and whatever. The guy that wrote the Blue Zones book hit upon connection and people having a community and people having face-to-face -face contact with each other. And then all of a sudden, I think that in the last mm, few months, I would say, that seems to have kind of almost be trumping diet as the thing that most people are talking yep. about more so than diet yeah. it's, it's all becoming about connectivity and face-to-face -face connectivity yeah. i think do you want to get involved with a community of other dads who are looking to develop themselves to continue the conversations we have here on this podcast in a place for dads only that fosters brotherhood camaraderie and personal growth then we have just the place for you at the guild of dads facebook group you can connect with other dads on a similar journey share experiences, offer support and seek support. Most of all, you can get some accountability in your own journey and get involved with the discussions and topics that every dad faces. So look us up on Facebook, join up and get involved with the discussion. Looking forward to seeing you in the Guild so you can start your journey with us today. Yeah, well, the, the, I think one of the big surprises that's come out of the woodwork over the last perhaps 15 years, has been the extent to which the number and quality of friends you have is the single best predictor of how healthy you're going to be, um, how quickly you recover from you know, minor diseases that afflict us, or whether they even bother you, how um, quickly you recover from surgery, uh, and even how long you live um, than anything else, you know. And of course, you know, this has been a big shock to the medics because, and a puzzle for them because they don't really understand why this should work because their whole kind of way of thinking about diseases and things is, you know, you, you do something, you pills or you cut a bit out or whatever it may be. Um, 
And that, you know, there's a, my favorite example of this is a very nice study which pulled together data from about 148 heart, studies of heart attack patients. And their kind of output measure here was, did you survive 12 months after that first heart attack? So this, you can't argue with this, you know, this is not your opinion, either you survived or you didn't, simple as that. And then they, they and it says about 300,000 people in the, in, in the total in the studies, a big sample. And they looked to see what best predicted whether you survived those first 12 months or not. And the two things that came out way ahead of everything else was the number and quality of your friendships followed closely in second place by giving up smoking. <laughs> anything else you could be as obese as you like you could slob about as much as you like do as little exercise you like you could take whatever pills you like or not you could uh eat as many big macs as you like whatever and it made no i won't say it made no difference but it didn't come close to the magnitude of the effect that just being embedded in in the friendship network did and i think that's sort of a, a really striking example of how important in the end um, f friendships are, you know, and it's that small inner core group, what I sometimes call the shoulders to cry on um, uh, group of friends. So they're the people who will take the time to kind of give you a bit of support if, if you need it, to, um, you know, be that financial support or emotional support or social support or whatever. Uh, you know, they're the people who are willing to drop everything and come to your aid. But the big difficulty with that is you can't just pick a friend up now uh, and expect to get the benefit. It's too late. You know, you've got to set these groups up, if you like, little friendship groups up well before you actually need them. Because otherwise, you know, if you haven't invested time in the relationships, there's no incentive for the other people to drop everything and, and come and help you out. Mm. And I think there's been a kind of shift. I mean, I guess in, in, in the historical past, you had much greater separation of the sexes in village life. You know, the, the, the women, you know, did, you know, did their, their things as it were together and on one side of the village. And then the men did their things together in the field or in the pub or whatever it may be. Um, and you probably had much closer friendship relations because this is very, very clear. If you look at people's networks, social networks now, they're very, very highly uh, gender specific. So about 70% of men's friends are men and about 70% of women's friends are women. Um, uh, and so, so there's something kind of that work, seems to work better, you know, sort of within sex uh, in terms of within sex friendships, that seems to be important. And, and historically, you would have seen that, of course, in a lot of historical societies. You know, the women get locked away in, in, in special quarters, or there are men's societies and separate women's secret societies that, 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 that they kind of meet up once a week or once a month or whatever. But I think we've kind of somehow in the last 50 years or so, that's kind of been lost and, and somehow it's, you know, I think the answer is it hasn't quite worked, maybe. And maybe we're seeing a little bit of a shift back to having kind of blokes groups reemerging again. And presumably the girls are doing whatever uh, it, it, it is similar for them. But I'm very struck that there's a real difference between men's and women's social style in this context. As women's friendships tend to be very intense and, and often they'll have just a very, very small number of extremely intense friendships. Uh, perhaps only, you know, one. This is the classic best friend forever phenomenon. Um, and, and guys will tend to have this little group of perhaps four or five other guys that they go drinking with or they play five a side with on a Friday night. You know, they go canoeing with whatever it may be that they do. Um, and those are much more casual, but they have the essence of a club. And I think that's the real difference is guys like clubs and mm. girls don't. Girls want to chatter to each other. Guys are very happy to sit there in complete silence <laughs> <laughs> in a group. And I, I'm very struck with this uh, in terms of formal dinners. You know, uh, that if you have, you know, there's still a number of um, kind of 
um, uh, uh, men-only societies. And they're very often built around ritual and formal speeches. And guys will just sit there politely listening. You'll never get women to do that. I'm sorry, but you won't. (laughs) Because they want to talk to each other. That's how their social world works. Mm. You know, nothing wrong with it. It's, mm. you know, it's just a different dynamic, and and we saw this very nicely. And um, we did a eighteen month study of some six formers from uh, a northern town. Their last six months at school, and then their first year away at university. And we were trying to look what happened when you moved away from your friends. And what came out very strongly out of that was that what kept old friendships. So pre-university friendships going in a context where they would naturally have died because you're not seeing them. For girls, it was making a big effort to try and talk to them, either by phone or you know going to see them. But it was actually talking that, that was important. And talking had no effect whatsoever. I mean, zero effect on whether or not boys' friendships survived. What made the difference for them was doing stuff together, it's making an effort to kind of do stuff together. And, you know, that doesn't require talking necessarily. Mm. That just requires being there, you know, in my sort of archetypal kind of Mickey Mouse cartoon version of this is two old Greek men sitting in the sunshine on a pavement cafe, either side of a table, occasionally taking a sip of a pasty or a, coffee and just communing quietly not saying anything just communing quietly and that's a guy's friendship mm. yeah yeah <laughs> you know, um, and it comes back to and, it, and, and it's always funny isn't it when 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 you've been out with a group of a group of your friends and you get in and your wife says so um so how's so-and-so's wife and you say and 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 uh, and and you say we didn't really talk about that, and and, and well, what about this? And well, we didn't we didn't yeah. really talk about that. Well, what did you talk about? Um, just guy, you know, just guy yeah. stuff, just guy stuff. <laughs> I know. Yes, I've been there, done that. <laughs> uh, it's very funny. You know, I've had, a, I have no, I couldn't count the number of occasions when people have said to me, both professionals, heard it from social psychologists, women social psychologists, uh, and also just casually from lay people saying, you know. Um, we could go to a dinner party and when we come home at night, my wife knows everything about everybody's family that was there. And, and I, I heard that conversation, but I don't remember any of it. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, and it's a kind of, uh, you know, it's, it's, and that's partly a reflection of the fact that women's social networks, you know, are, are very, I wouldn't say formalized, but they're, they're, they're very much about these personalized relationships. So they want to know everybody fits in and, uh, you know, and, and, and how they tick and so on. Whereas guys, social world seems to be much more casual in that sense. And, and these kind of details don't matter. It's, you know, what, what kind of makes it tick is having a bit of a joke at somebody's expense, you know, mm. you know, sort of uh, um, a, a, a bit of a discussion about, you know, the Saturday night football match and mm. what a hash the referee made of it again yeah. 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 <laughs> and these kind of things. And that's almost here today and gone tomorrow. It's not really, it's not really a matter of, of enormous import. So it's not something you bother to remember to go home and tell your wife that, well, yes, we discussed exactly how Jimmy kicked the ball because <laughs> that wasn't the point of the discussion. You know, it's yeah. just having something generic to talk about, which just allows you to carry on being in each other's presence. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a little more subtle, isn't it? Well, I think, you know, th- there's a kind of fashion uh, uh, being uh, promulgated for trying to turn boys into girls or girls into boys, you know, and I think this is complete misunderstanding of how the actual, you know, social world of, of the two sexes really works. And, I, you know, it's... I don't think it's a good idea. For, it's not going to be a good idea for them because it's just going to yeah. produce confused people. But mm. well, that's one thing I was going to loop back into actually because I think it, I think it interlinks to what we were saying about how people are communicating with each other and how people have lost that ability to have uh, what I think probably Jordan uh, Jordan uh, Peterson would describe as uh, civil discourse. That the art of yes. civil discourse seems to yes. have been lost. 
And yes. and again, a theme that comes up in my dis- uh, many of my discussions around around men and boys and marriage and um, fatherhood is this kind of homogenization of the sexes that there seems to be a push towards at the moment, whereby you know um, um, girls can't be girls anymore, boys can't be boys anymore. We've all yeah. got to kind of blend into this kind of. Um, uh, Anonymity. <laughs> Anonymity and this kind of utopian idea yeah. of this experiment, if you like, mm. where we're trying to, um, you know, um, sweep away everything that's happened over thousands of years of hard yeah. wiring and say, yeah. right, we're going to re-engineer, in, re-engineer this in a way that we think is societally correct. And, yes. And, and, I, yeah. and I wonder whether some of this is causing, a, you know, we, we've touched upon a lot in this discussion about how the modern world is affecting our kind of neurology and how our neurology reacts to it. I wonder whether this this whole kind of re-engineering, if you like, is also having a negative effect on kind of, you know, um, people just feeling ha- uh, uh, happy within who they are and how they interact and and being different. I'm I'm a man. I'm different to a, wo- a woman. A woman interacts with women in a different way to, to what a man interacts with mm. a man. And mm. th- there seems to be this push kind of maybe even quite an aggressive push now to kind of just sweep that away and so that's not right for you to feel like a guy does and that's not right for you to yep. feel like a, yep. a, a lady does yep. and yeah whether this is playing into this whole you know the mental health issues that we are seeing right now where people are um uh i make no bones about it suff- suffering so <laughs> unnecessarily perhaps even yep yep well i i, I mean i think uh Kind of at one level, it's a lot of this goes back to the fact that um, uh, you know there's a, there's a lot of variation within both sexes, of course. But at one end, you've got a bunch of males who are basically not very nice people, you know, who clearly cause a lot of damage psychologically and physically, uh, both to uh, other men and to women. And so you can kind of see why this might have arisen, because this is an attempt, if you like, to try and control that end of, uh, of male, male behavior. Um, you could argue that, um, uh, it's worth a try to see if we can, uh, engineer it by, by socialization. I think the evidence is rather beginning to run very strongly to suggest that you know, antisocial males are just antisocial because of, you know, their genetic makeup largely. And the same is true, for, of course, for women because there's a sort of little uh, 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 group at the bottom end of, of the women's distribution who are also extremely antisocial in their behavior. It's just that it, they don't go so far down uh, uh, as men to, to seem to do. Um, and then that, at the end of the day, that's... You kind of, I think, you just have to accept that that not everybody is a good citizen. Um, you know, you're gonna. You know, it's part of the rich tapestry of life. You know, people vary. It's, you know, there isn't a kind of all blokes aren't exactly the same. All women aren't exactly the same in their psychologies. There's variation, and the variations overlap in the same sense that it is true that on average guys are taller than. Uh, the girls are, but mm. not all blokes are taller than all girls. You know, some girls are taller than some blokes. So in biology, you always have that kind of variability and that overlap, even when the mean, the, the averages, if you, if you like them. But I think the, the, the marker on this, uh, there's a lot of argument that, well, if you, um, if you bring up boys uh, in a, a, not to be so competitive, even if that's their kind of predisposition, you can kind of train them to, 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 to behave uh, more nicely. Uh, and of course, the answer is you can. I mean, you, you have to be probably fairly, fairly Victorian about it. <laughs> Otherwise, they, they, they're not going to learn. But, um, you know, I, I'm always reminded of the fact that, I mean, I grew up in Africa uh, and uh, from... Uh, you know, before I started learning language, as it were, so I'm bilingual in Kiswahili and, and in English. I didn't realize till I was 40 that there were no genders in Kiswahili. 
There are no she's, she's and he's in the language. You know, it's a completely genderless language. And it was only drawn to my attention <laughs> at a meeting when some anthropologist uh, had said to somebody from uh, Kenya that it must be wonderful to grow up in a cultural environment speaking a language which doesn't have genders because it must make everything <laughs> sweetness and light. And they went, what? <laughs> These are the most misogynistic people I've ever come across. <laughs> but the thing is, nobody ever made any mistakes, you know? I mean, it was, you know, I, I just never even thought about it. And I just would switch from English to Swahili uh, and back again without thinking about it. But it didn't dawn on me that actually there were no he, she's, and <laughs> it's in the language. It wasn't like French where you had to sort of get the end of every adjective correct for the, for, for the noun. Um, but it didn't change how you viewed the world. You know, there were still men, there were still women, and some men still behave badly. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and so on, you know, and I, so I'm, I, I have to say I'm very, very skeptical that, that you can, uh, make such large scale changes. I mean, yes, you can shift things up and down a little bit by, by socialization. You can make boys behave a little bit nicer than they might otherwise do, you know, the, and if you don't, you know, they're going to end up, you know, sort of um, living a, 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 as feral packs on, a, 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 on isolated islands, as it were, classic sort of uh, style. Um, but, uh, you know, you can't kind of wrench them completely out of, out of this thing because their whole kind of social psyche is, is just very different. And, it, and from a very, very early age, you know. Um, you can see these trends emerging extremely young, both in the way they play with toys and in the way they they play games in the playground. You know, boys tend to play in bigger groups. Girls tend to play in much more, uh, you know, sort of groups of two and involving a lot of talking and so on. Mm. Whereas boys will sort of run around and you know, jump over each other and, yeah. be rough you know? yeah. <laughs> and you see that in monkeys it's exactly the same thing in monkeys that um boisterous uh you know boys are much more boisterous uh the girl monkeys pull out of play groups off after a while because it's just getting too boisterous and and, and they'll go and you know find literally find a, somebody else's baby to, to 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 play with and and they'd much rather do that than kind of get involved in these kind of uh boisterous uh, boys games it's, mm. It's... Mm. and in terms of um, anxiety and depression that, that that seems to be kind of rife um, at the moment we've certainly spoken about a lot and topical and it is it is part and parcel of what a lot of people are going through when I've spoken to um, psychologists before we've 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 discussed a you know the fight or flight response and you know people were becoming a little bit more aware of kind of the fight or flight response and we've all heard the you know the saber-toothed tiger story and stuff and um what your body does when it's going to go into fight or flight and <laughs> and, and, and whatever um what i've sort of observed with uh, with some of the uh, stories that i've heard is is whether or not we're moving from a a like a situational fight or flight towards like a more of a mental fight or flight so whereas people would have been kind of fleeing from a situation so to speak uh, which they can still do if there's like a you know a terrorist attack or something that's that is you know is is a threat to life it seems like now people are kind of more that their fight or flight is against their kind of emotions or their thoughts or their their perception of of, of threat rather than actual kind of a physical threat itself and, and and I often wonder whether or not that kind of that constant kind of low level, um, that low level stress, w what sort of effect that has on you know on the human body in terms of you know adrenaline being fired on a kind of regular you know a, a regular basis, rather than it being a big firing if you like at this constant low level you know stress that people are under if you like. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think there's no question but that the modern world is very different in terms of the way stress is imposed on us. Um, and that's, you know, I mean, there are stresses in the hunter-gatherer world in terms of the fact that, you know, you didn't manage to get anything to eat today because, you know, 
the, you missed when you fired your arrow or when you went off to somewhere you thought there was going to be a nice tree full of uh, fruits. It, it wasn't, you know, they're not ready yet. Um, so you, you know, your, your diet is up and down. And you've got physiological stresses. Um, whereas now you've got much more in the way of mental stress. And I think in small scale societies, your life is much more regulated. Uh, it's much more defined by the social rules of the society. And because it's defined by the fact that the community as a whole is acting as a policeman, mm -hmm. right? You know, it's the, there's everybody's granny sitting by their fireside, wagging their finger at you every time you step out of line. So it keeps you kind of, confined within a reasonable range of behavior. And I think probably two things have happened for us is one, um, you know, we've lost that sense of communal policing, uh, if you like, by the elders of society, of the younger members of society and keeping everybody in line. Um, uh, and secondly, you know, you've had, you have had this shift from, if you like, more, physical stresses of daily survival to these kind of mental stresses, because now you're thrown into this very complex world, often full of people you don't really know terribly well. And, and in the small scale traditional societies, you know, these people would be far out in your, your, your social network and you wouldn't really see them very often. So the structure of your social network really consists of a series of layers, the inner layers of the you know, your best friends and your good friends and so on, and runs out to about 150 people, roughly, family and friends. And then beyond that is the layer that runs out to about 500, which we call the acquaintances layer. <clears throat> so this is an extra 350 people. A lot of those people are people you work with, so you actually see them every day. Well, in small-scale traditional society, they're the guys from the next village. <laughs> you only see them once a year. At the village inter village cricket match. <laughs> Basically. Um, you know, or you know, that's where you get your wives and husbands from, you know, sort of you meet up once a year and there's a, a, a big sort of uh marriage uh, swapping uh, arrangements go on. Um so so you know, now you you you're thrust into living with these people day in, day out. You actually see more of them in a funny sort of way then you do your own family at home because you spend so, such long periods at work. And, you know, <clears throat> so these are, this is your, your social life is turned topsy turvy uh, because it's with these, most of it's with these people. You kind of, well, you know, you'd go and have a beer with them and you get on perfectly okay with them, but you kind of, you, you'd never invite them home for, for, you know, your big five O birthday party or your kind of christening or, or your mm. your wedding, and they're definitely not going to turn up to your funeral, which is, that's for sure. <laughs> so, so they're they're kind of you know we're we're kind of living back to front in many ways, I think, and and that probably doesn't help mm -hmm. because it means you're you know in in, in the small scale society that those people would be boxed off and dealt with in a kind of generic sort of way. Yeah, they they're the people from that village. Um, you know, we have a general way of dealing with people from that village. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's all we need to know, you know, <laughs> need to know any more about. Whereas now you're kind of living and working with them in very close proximity. So, and because you have to work with them, you need to know much more about them in order to be able to kind of integrate what you do with in the business with what mm -hmm. they do in the business. And, you know, you have arguments with them because one of you is not doing your bit properly and, so on and so forth. So it's just ramping everything up, I think, and making life less less pleasant. And that's why people kind of go, oh, sod it, you know, I'm going to retire at 25 with my huge banker's millions and buy a cottage in the Cotswolds, yeah. or, you know, a Scottish island somewhere, and live on in a small-scale society. Because actually, you know, although people complain about the intrusiveness of everybody being interested in your business, um, Nonetheless, you know, that has huge benefits because that provides this kind of support network, really. Mm. And this is one of the arguments that you often hear in the context of psychiatry and medical anthropology in particular is, 
you, know, you don't see the levels of psychiatric illnesses in, let's say, <clears throat> um, traditional societies in Africa or, or, or South Asia that you see, you know, in the industrialized uh, countries mm. because people are, um, you know, embedded in these extended family and friendship and village support networks in a way in those societies in the way that we s simply don't have them anymore because our networks have just become dispersed all over the country. You know? mm. Mm. What do you think that the, what do you think the future holds Robin in terms of where we're going with all this? The $64,000 <laughs> question <laughs> in terms of, uh, do, do you think it's a case of we're going to, it could be a case of back, back to the future. Do you think we're seeing elements of that? beginning to creep back in at the moment or i mean you, you you're, you're a far more learned individual than i am on this subject that's for sure well uh, the future the future is always unpredictable the one thing you learn in science is never to predict anything because it's always wrong because you haven't understood <laughs> all the details that are important uh, <clears throat> um but the despite <laughs> despite that classic um, example of how good science is at predicting with, in the Apollo 13 mission. I mean, you know, it's a piece of science, you know, to, to, to let those guys go on and use the moon as a ricochet to get them back to Earth when they got no power <laughs> or hardly any power left on the, 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 uh, the, the spacecraft. And a computer which was smaller than the, the average Nintendo Game Boy. <laughs> as well <laughs> and to make those predictions and say no no you know theory says we can do that and we'll get them back okay it was just an amazing triumph of, of science really but most of the time we can't do that and i think that's particularly true you know that's physics so physics is is a bit sort of more hard you know it doesn't vary so much the biological world and the psychological world are just utterly unpredictable because it depends on just what interacts with what in terms of populations uh, over time. Um, so uh, that said, um, I think I have a bit more faith in human nature and the size of our brain in being able to sort something out. Because if you, I think if you look at history of humanity, you know, what you see is an amazing capacity to find solutions to things. Right. So, 300 years ago, the Reverend Malthus was forecasting doom and gloom uh, because the population, the human population, was uh, expanding faster than our rate of it, it productivity for, for agriculture. And he said, you know, we, we're just going to end up with too many people and not enough to eat. Uh, and, you know, population said to crash. And there was nothing wrong with his logic. It was perfectly correct. What he didn't realize or didn't factor in was that they were just about to launch into the agricultural revolution of the 18th century. So, uh, you know, the, the huge um, improvements in agricultural practice and in the breeds of animals and plants and so on allowed food productivity to compensate and, and match uh, population growth again. So we're kind of in the same situation now, repeating that cycle of people going doom and gloom, doom and gloom. And the answer is, once we realize what the problem is, you know, we often can find a solution. Now, you know, if that solution requires some psychological rejigging, you know, we can probably do it if we do it slowly. What, you, what doesn't work, I think, is if you try and do it fast. You know, these things have to kind of develop slowly uh, and allow people to adjust to, to, to new ideas. It, you know, all revolutions... Um, uh, political or otherwise, just end up with large numbers of people suffering very, very badly, uh, and usually a lot of them being killed. You know, <laughs> so it's not really uh, uh, an ideal way forward, I think. But I think you know, if we just allow nature to take its course, human ingenuity can often find a solution. From doesn't mean to say you don't get disasters on the way. And again, you just look at the history of uh, um, the last. 3,000 years or so where, you know, uh, cities, big cities have grown up and be very powerful and then they've kind of just disappeared literally overnight because they've destroyed their environments, usually is what's happened. Mm. 
um, you know, sort of Easter Island to 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 sort of the big uh, cities of Central and South America uh, and and the Middle East. Um, there are loads and loads of examples, <clears throat> but you know, humans have been able to get by. Bad luck for the people that happened to be living there at the time. They didn't do very well. You know, <laughs> they they died of starvation or they killed each other. Usually, the latter. Um, but then, you know, other people round about managed to find solutions and, and move on. So, yeah, it you know, it's going to be a rocky road probably into the future. But I think we'll find ways of dealing with it. And that may result in adjustments to how we live with each other and how our uh, kind of social and marital arrangements uh, are organized. And you, you only have to look at the variety of <clears throat> social and marital systems around the um, uh, the world in different cultures, you know, to see that that's there is some flexibility there. It doesn't always work perfectly in everybody's interest, but often it, 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 it you know, in, in terms of a can do and good enough sort of uh, solution to a problem, you know, it works. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Robin, it's it's been a very interesting uh, conversation we've had this evening, and and I've really enjoyed uh, being able to unpack a lot of this stuff and lay some of this some of these ideas that have come together in some of the other discussions that I've had with people around, you know, specifically kind of mental health and also the um, the role of men in society, the role of women in society, the role of boys. It's it's going to um, it's one of those discussions that I could quite easily probably talk to you for a good three to four hours on very easily. So, uh, but um, in terms of the uh, people finding out about you and the work that you've done over the years, I know you've written a number of books as well. What is the best uh, way for listeners to find out about some of the work that you've done and, um, and what you've uh, got coming up? I suppose um, the, there are two books that uh, uh, you can buy on the shelf now. One is, um, uh, a book called The Science of Love and Betrayal, mm -hmm. uh, which, funnily enough, when it was published in America, the American publishers insisted on dropping the and betrayal because they said Americans don't do betrayal. They won't buy a book without the title. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. That's really focused on our romantic relationships and, and, and romantic world, if you like, of personal relationship. Okay. And then there's a, a Pelican book, um, uh, the Penguin Science series, Little Blue Penguin Science series, on just called Human Evolution, which sort of has a lot of these ideas in. But I'm just in the processes of finishing a big book, uh, which will probably be called um, The Seven Pillars of Friendship, um, which is really kind of an overview of all the work we've done on friendships and, and social evolution in humans in the last 20, 25 years. So it's an attempt to pull all this stuff together and, and, and show the big pattern, as it were, and mm -hmm. sort of looks at the benefits of friendships and, and how we make friendships and how we break friendships and, and, yeah. and all these kind of things. Yeah. But that won't be out till uh, probably early next year, I would think. Okay. Well, we'll um, I'll make a note to uh, reach out to you before that happens, yeah. and uh, we can have a uh, we can have yeah, a discussion a discussion about that. Definitely, definitely. Yeah. Um, yeah. A, a question I wanted to ask you, Robbie, was what what is the thing that has given you the most meaning in your life? What we do around Guild of Dads is help guys to really kind of look look towards forming a vision for where they want to go and what they want to do uh, in order to give them meaning. Um, so I just wondered, wondered what what uh, has given you meaning over the course of your life or what do you find that gives you meaning? Um, I suppose the answer is having a, having a abiding interest in something, you know, if you like a hobby of some kind. My hobby happens to be kind of understanding the world, understanding people and how they tick. You know, it's, it's for me, you know, that's what I spent my life doing and it's a bit like giving somebody who's a keen fisherman, uh, I know, a rod and a pack of sandwiches every day and say, just go and sit on the riverbank and enjoy yourself. But to me, that's what, you know, you've got to have something which gets you up in the morning, motivates you, and, I, you know, sort of at some level excites your interest. So I don't care what it is, you know, it can be football, it can be intellectual things, you know, who cares? As long as it, you have that kind of focus, it could be making little models or whatever. 
Um, you've got to have that. But I, I think the second uh, and, and sort of other side of that coin is still we are intensely social and, and the quality of your life and how long you live and so on is always going to be determined by your your friends. It's, it's not necessarily having hundreds of friends in the Facebook style. <laughs> it's the mistake uh, kids often make is they think, you know, if you just have befriend more and more people, you're doing better. And the answer is no. <laughs> you, it's that small core, and it doesn't matter whether it's only one guy or, or it's five guys, uh, it's having that little group that you kind of go and do stuff with, I think. And that might be just having a pint Friday nights and, you know, together and a, and a bit of a chat and so on. But, you know, having that little space, I think, is important for guys, mm -hmm. especially, and um, gives them a bit of balance and, you know, the sort of the stresses of, of the rest of life and, uh, and the stresses of home, <laughs> child rearing and all these other things which we have to do. I think if you, you know, if you, if you have those, you, you kind of have a more relaxed ability to cope with all these kind of other stresses and they don't phase you quite so much. Mm -hmm. yeah. you, can, you can ride the stormy waves you know, serenely like the Buddhist monks that you referred to at the beginning yeah yeah excellent I love it thank you very much for today uh, Robin it was a pleasure speaking to you and well, um, and, I, and I wish you all the very best sir well thank you very much it was great fun talking to you thanks very much thanks a lot bye bye now, I hope you enjoyed my conversation with Robin. We discussed a couple of his books towards the end of our conversation, which were The Science of Love and Betrayal and Human Evolution, both of which you can find on Amazon.co.uk. He also mentioned another book which is coming out in 2021, so keep an eye out for that. And obviously, I will endeavour to get in touch with Robin when that comes out and we can have a more full discussion on that particular book. The reason that I had Robin in to have a discussion with me on Guild of Dads is because in the conversations that I have with various different guests that I have on the Guild of Dads podcast, I often find that there are different things which come up. Uh, as I discussed with Robin, there's different concepts that come up which I wanted his help in kind of lacing together. Now, commonly, those things that come up in my conversations with other guests are often around mental health in terms of you know how people are often suffering from high levels of depression and anxiety in the modern world and how really our brains are adapted in terms of how we can actually cope with the rigors of the modern world so those two things in and of themselves are two of the reasons why that I wanted to speak to to Robin amongst a few other things that often come up in conversations and I think what was interesting about the conversation I had with Robin very much so is his view that large-scale societies that we've uh, that we've arrived at in terms of where we are right now with the population boom they don't lend themselves to kind of good uh, mental health and they don't lend themselves to us being able to uh, cope and react and adapt to them in the way that we would have done in smaller scale societies and he had some quite interesting points to make around why small scale societies remove that element of anonymity that we now have in a lot of the kind of larger scale uh, societies now it was interesting what he said about echo chambers in terms of the internet and discussions that people have on the internet and how it doesn't always allow for kind of broad discussion of different subjects and people can often find themselves in echo chambers. What really kind of struck me was when we were talking about developing close relationships and particularly the studies that Robin referenced in terms of how the number and quality of friends you have is the single biggest predictor of how healthy you will be and it really does strike home that, it, that it's something that you kind of really do have to invest in in terms of growing uh, that that uh, longevity in your life around having uh, quality relationships that you can depend upon. And like we discussed in our conversation, I think the debate and discussion has very much moved on from how we can promote longevity through diets to this very interesting discussion around how having a community and people around you is a lot more of a indicator of longevity and health 
than a lot of other things that people are looking at um, in terms of the kind of health and fitness space. So some really interesting discussions there and I hope that you enjoyed the conversation that I had with Robin and clearly he is a man that has invested a lot of energy and education in this specific subject over the years. If you want to hear more discussions just like this one today, the best way to do it is by subscribing on your podcast player of choice, be that iTunes, Google Podcasts or Spotify. If you subscribe, then you will uh, get to find out the podcast episodes that are coming up each week. They'll just pop up on your podcast player of choice. So that is the best way to hear more discussions like the one today. You can drop us a rating and review. That would be very much appreciated. But the biggest compliment that you can give to me is by just sharing this episode out however you want to, whether that be on WhatsApp, Messenger or text. The more information that can be shared out, it's really important. As some of the information can be truly life-changing for dads that you may know. So if you can do that, that would be really fantastic and I would really appreciate it. You can get involved with the discussion on Facebook, Instagram or Twitter using the handle at Guild of Dads and check out our Facebook group to join the Guild. If you like what you hear and you want to email me, I love to hear from listeners. So ping me an email joe at guildofdads.com. Let me know what you like, what you don't like and who you would like me to interview even. I'd love to know. Thanks for listening. If you want to find out more about what we're doing at Guild of Dads, then head over to www.guildofdads.com and in the meantime, live a life of vision, action and meaning.